and there's more people coming in. It's such an honor to have everybody here at the People's Forum for this very, very important discussion. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I think we're almost out of seats, if that's the case. And uh, so if there are no more seats, please feel free to stand around. Um, just a couple of things. You can get this book at the bookstore, HNO4 Books, by the front, if you haven't done it already. We'll be signing, Vijay will be signing books at the end. Um, so make sure you get your copy. We have a limited number. Um, but yes, welcome, everybody. How are you all feeling? <laughs> Woo! All right. Um, this is an amazing book. I am so excited for us to get into it because we're, what now? It's a little over a year since the US withdrew from Afghanistan after 20 years of occupation, which for most people looking around the room is the majority of our lifetimes, which is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And there has not been one word of dissent from any of the ruling parties in the White House. So I'm really, really excited for this book, which is really a materialization of a, a conversation between two people who need no introduction, Vijay Prashad and Noam Chomsky, um, and not just telling us what happened, but giving us, starting opening the discussion so we can figure out what are we going to do so we can move forward in a world that's not dominated by US war, where we don't have to keep seeing more millions and millions of people dying just for US hege hegemony. So uh, I want to first also pass it off to our dear friend Emily from the New Press. Without the New Press, this book would not have happened. So Emily, if you would like to, I don't see you, where are you? There you are, there you are. If you would like to come up and say a few words and then we'll get the conversation going. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks Lyon. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. And Oh, okay. Hi, thank you Lyon and thanks everyone for being here and to Noam and Vijay for writing this really important book. Um, I'll keep this really brief. Um, I'm supposed to say this, sorry guys. Uh, the New Press amplifies progressive voices for a more inclusive, just, and equitable world. As a nonprofit public, public interest publisher, we leverage books, diverse voices, and media engagement to facil facilitate social change, enrich public discourse, and defend democratic values. Um, okay, I'll give this to Vijay now. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, hi, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. This is the second book launch I've done in, in, uh, in August. And both book launches, I flew in from South America on a flight that arrived that morning. So today I arrived from Brazil. Noam Chomsky is sitting in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I was super happy to be able to walk over to his apartment and give him the book not long ago, maybe a week ago. Um, Noam is going to speak for about 15 or 20 minutes first. And then I'll make a few remarks, and then we'll, we'll, we'll chat amongst uh, ourselves. I hope that's OK. Um, if you'd like Noam to speak longer, just say the word. And you know, Noam can speak for as long as you'd like. Give the people what they want. That's the key <laughs> phrase, right? So Noam, would you like to take it, um, take it in any direction you'd like? Well, I'm, I, think you should I think you should start now. Uh, maybe a good idea to let, some, let people know what some of the broad themes were. So go ahead, Noam, please.
Just a second, Noam. I think we've lost your voice for a minute. Kate, can we recover it? Okay. Noam, can you just have a, it's not muted. It's not muted. Something's happened to the mic. Do we want him to sign in again? Just let's see. Yeah. Yeah, Noam, would you uh, just go out and come back in again? Uh, it's the dangers of these things. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Yeah, just have him sign in again. Okay, let's try again. Yes, beautiful. Yay! Great, great. And you were telling us what, yeah, go ahead. That's just fine. Don't worry about the delay. We're, we're, we're hearing you just fine now.
a certain history with regard to Russia, which I don't have to recount. Uh, Gorbachev agreed to let Germany uh, unify and join NATO, a hostile military alliance. It's quite a concession in the light of history, but he agreed. There was a quid pro quo. Bush, President Bush agreed that, Ger that NATO would not expand one inch to the east, to the east of Germany. Gorbachev agreed with that. Uh, there's been a good deal of deceit and, and uh, misinformation about the nature of that agreement. It's perfectly unambiguous, straightforward. You can look it up on the internet at the National Security Archive, which has the original documents. And that was the agreement. Well, what's the role of NATO now? It was interesting to see how that was handled. Uh, the Bush administration, of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed, had to come out with a new national security strategy, a new defense budget, no more Soviet Union. And it makes very interesting reading. I urge you to look back on it. Basically, it said there were three main points. It said we have to maintain a huge military system. Why? Not because of the Russians, they're gone. Because of the technological sophistication of third world countries. Well, in a well indoctrinated country like ours, people don't burst out laughing at that point. So because of the technological sophistication of the South, the third world, we have to maintain this monstrous military system, which totally dominates uh, the rest of the world. Second question is, what do we do with the, what was called the defense industrial base? That's basically the high tech economy. Uh, well, we have to maintain it as a way of supporting our major military system. And of course, the general economy. Thirdly, we have to maintain intervention forces aimed at the Middle East. Those were the main intervention forces since Carter, 45 years. So we have to maintain those. The reason, interesting reason, they said, a quote, we have to maintain intervention forces aimed at the Middle East, where our major problems could not have been laid at the Kremlin's door. In other words, we've been lying to you for 50 years, claiming that the problem in the Middle East was the Russians. No, problem was radical independent nationalism. That's why we needed the intervention forces. And that's why we need them now. It was good to see the clouds lifted very briefly. They returned pretty soon. That was the immediate reaction internally to the United States. Beyond that, the next step was when Bill Clinton took over the presidency uh, to break the agreement with Gorbachev and expand NATO to the east. Began under Clinton, extended further under the second Bush, first year. Uh, but President Bush lived up to the promise. And Clinton wasted almost no time in dismantling it, uh, moving NATO to the Russian border. Russians didn't like that, opposed it, including Gorbachev, but they accepted it, didn't respond. They did, however, impose a red line. This is before Putin, every Russian leader, that Georgia and Ukraine not join NATO. So the rest of the countries, they tolerated it, not Ukraine, not Georgia. Uh, that was perfectly well understood by the highest level of the US diplomatic corps uh, virtually every official who had any knowledge of Russia 
made it very clear and explicit to the government, US government have been doing so for 30 years, that it's reckless and provocative to try to uh, reject this Russian uh, red line, which is completely understandable in the light of both history and even the topography of the region. That includes the present past directors of the CIA, uh, Reagan's ambassador to Russia, Jack Matlock, one of the leading Russia specialists and a host of others, famously George Kennan. Uh, there was no doubt about it. Well, I'm not gonna run through what did happen, but NATO needed uh, a new justification. Couldn't be the Russians are coming. And it didn't take long for it to come, come along. Uh, the Secretary General of NATO, uh, Dutch, uh, uh, Dutchman uh, Jok de Scheffer, uh, he declared that the task of NATO is to protect uh, the international energy system, including sea lanes and pipelines. That makes NATO basically an international force. Uh, Shortly along with that came the new concepts of uh, humanitarian intervention. We need NATO in order to carry out humanitarian interventions in the world. Uh, came other devices, but essentially one or another pretext was developed to justify NATO. Well, let's come up to the present, skipping a lot of what happened, which is very important. Where do we stand now? Uh, right now, the Ukraine war uh, settled the issue, at least temporarily, of the status of Europe. The uh, Putin's aggression in Ukraine uh, gave the United States an enormous gift, handed it to Washington on a silver platter. Uh, Europe subordinated itself completely for the time being to the NATO Atlanticist vision. No more talk right now about Gorbachev's common European home. I think that could have been avoided. It's a long story, a lot to say, but it happened. So where do we stand now? Well, the United States has made its official position very clear, very explicit, was announced a couple of months ago at the US air base in Germany, the Rammstein air base, where the United States called the NATO powers, a couple of others together uh, to lay down the official policy. It was reinforced, expanded at the NATO summit a couple of weeks ago. Interesting summit for the first time, NATO included, uh, brought into the conference, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, and NATO uh, expanded the geographic concept, North Atlantic, to include the Indo-Pacific region. So now the North Atlantic includes the Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, all the ocean surrounding China, and the U.S. allies in the region are, part, are not formally, but informally associated with NATO. The official policy with regard to Russia is to continue, maintain the uh, Ukraine war in order to weaken Russia severely. In fact, to weaken it so severely that it cannot undertake another such operation. Think about that for a minute, it's clear what it means. Uh, you recall the Versailles Conference in 1919, which was intended to weaken Germany sufficiently so that it could not carry out further aggression. That failed. So it has to be harsher than the super harsh 
uh, Versailles Treaty, which was a large factor that led to Nazism. That's not enough. That's official US policy right now. No negotiations, no diplomacy, just severely weakened Russia. And uh, hope that by some miracle, if Russia faces defeat, uh, it will simply slink away quietly uh, and not use the weapons that we all know it has to devastate Ukraine, and maybe beyond. We just take that gamble with the fate of Ukrainians in the world. Uh, and it's the world, it means tens of million people facing severe hunger, starvation with the closing off of the Black Sea region, a huge for food fertilizer exporting region, reverse the steps, the necessary steps towards dealing with the immense crisis of global warming, reverse those, expand fossil fuel production, and face the threat of nuclear war. We're willing to gamble on all that in order to ensure that Russia is severely weakened. That's our official position now. Well, all of this has to be overcome. It has to be, or else we're finished because of what must be the case if there's been decent survival. What's likely to happen? Well, we can only speculate. I think we can see some of the tensions that are arising. Take Europe again, right at the center of this. Europe is one of the losers in the current war. European economies are badly hit. Uh, Europe being cut off from its natural trading partner, Russia, is in severe difficulty. It's not just the cutoff of potential cutoff of, of petroleum products, that's a large part of it, but it's much more than that. Russia is very rich in mineral resources, doesn't have much of an economy, economy is about the level of Mexico, but it has very rich resources. Uh, even an effort to move towards sustainable energy in Europe, which of course is necessary, will require Russian minerals and much else. The temptations to get off of Washington's coattails and to move towards some kind of accommodation with Russia, those will be, are sure, sure to be increasingly serious. But there's more. Right behind Russia is the whole Eurasian system which is being developed by China and the Belt and Road Initiative, an enormous investment development program expanding all over Eurasia, including Russia, and based on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, includes uh, uh, India, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, uh, the uh, uh, a lack a failure of accommodation with Russia will block Europe from this enormous growing economic system and the China market itself, which is Europe's, it's a major export market. I think it's not likely that Europe is going to forego all of this uh, just in order to echo Washington's demands for continuing a war and no diplomacy in order to severely weaken Russia. We'll see. The Belt and Road Initiative is expanding into Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, even Latin America, the US backyard. A couple of dozen Latin American countries are now joining it, much to the annoyance and anger of the United States. U.S. is trying to block it, but you can't block that kind of program with bombs. The U.S. comparative advantage. How this will play out, your guess is as good as mine. But we do know that we must move towards accommodation of 
the current three major powers, bringing in Europe as a constructive major participant, hopefully aiming for something like Gorbachev's vision of a Europe, common European home, no military blocks, uh, working together for a more equitable and just future. That's the ideal. It's not reached. We'll basically be saying, sorry, it's the end of organized human society on earth. And I think that's a grim but fair estimate. I'll stop there. Um, there are many reasons to love Noam Chomsky, and I actually really love Noam Chomsky. Uh, one of them, of course, is that he's um, the most extraordinarily generous person. I think many of you have written him emails, many of you, and before that, perhaps letters. And he's written, he's personally replied to every email he gets. Um, he used to type out letters to everybody who wrote him letters. Um, in the afterward of the book, I, I write about how I, you know, wrote him a letter when he was sitting in his office in, in MIT about something or the other that I was doing. And of course, he, he replied. And I thought, my God, this is Noam Chomsky replying to, to me. And I started writing regularly to him. And he began to write me back regularly. And he began to write long letters, exploring things that I was sending him to read. And I thought, this is extraordinary. This is a level of intellectual and political generosity unparalleled. And I really mean this, unparalleled. I don't think there's an intellectual or political leader with us today who is as generous as Noam Chomsky. Um, so when I thought, look, I've covered these wars in Afghanistan, Libya, and Iraq, really ugly wars, you know, really, really ugly wars. And nobody really seems to care in the West about the detritus of these really, really, really ugly wars, horrendous wars. Over a million people, civilians, killed in Iraq, forgotten completely forgotten. Tens of hundreds of thousands of people, maybe more, lives destroyed in Afghanistan. Today, 90% of the population living in poverty with starvation as a daily situation in their lives. Completely forgotten in the Western world. Completely forgotten. People are so gripped with their great solidarity with Ukraine. They have no sense of the people's lives they destroyed in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in Libya, where there need not have been the horrendous destruction of the Libyan state. There need not have been that. You know, when you destroy a state, a modern state, that itself is a war crime, even if that state is doing terrible things. Because after the state has been destroyed, there's nothing left as an organizer of modern society, there's nothing left. Libya is a wreck. It's dangerous to fly into Tripoli today, 2022, 11 years after NATO's aggressive military action against not Gaddafi, but the Libyan state. At the time, I wrote a report from Tripoli, and I wrote and I said, it's easy, you know, I said it takes 100 years to build a state. It can be destroyed in an afternoon. It takes 100 years to build a state. It takes a long time for people to learn how to build institutions to take care of literacy, how to build institutions to take care of the management of trade and markets. In fact, not 100 years. I was being reckless. It takes hundreds of years to build those habits and then to build those actual infrastructure, the building, you know, the Ministry of XYZ. You bomb those things, 
you've now made it impossible for people to easily organize themselves. You know, I know that there's a predilection to believe people should just organize themselves. It's not so easy to do that immediately. Rather than that, you have chaos. And in the chaos, millions of people are suffering. There's complete amnesia. One of the great features of the work of Noam Chomsky is it's a, his work is a battle against amnesia. Like today, for instance, in 20 minutes, Noam basically laid out a vision of the most recent part of our modern history, which is completely absent in the mainstream discussion. Why is that absent? It's really interesting. In mainstream discussions, both in journalistic discussions, but also in intellectual discussions, in high writings in the academy, context has disappeared. Nobody wants to talk about context. If you start to talk about the context of what's happening in Ukraine, you're immediately pilloried as somebody who's not in immediately condemning something. It's a kind of Instagram culture of writing. You have to have an opinion before you've even had the option of doing an analysis. You must have an opinion. What do you believe? Do you believe that there's genocide here or genocide there? Let's not have a... Con the moment you say, no, let's contextualize something, oh, you're justifying it. Just the fact of contextualization is sufficient to accuse people of not having feeling. In fact, I would argue, those who are trying to decontextualize the world have lost feeling for the world. Because we are historical beings as much as we are social beings. We are not people without history. We are people suffused with history, suffused with social relations between us. That has to be methodologically at the core of how we understand things. That's a key part of the method of Noam Chomsky's work. Second key part, it's not just the context. It's also an element of rationality. I mean, you've got to look at things in a relatively rational way. Um, sometimes I used to pick up Noam's books and read them and start laughing really loudly. You know, because, because things are absurd in the world. You know, there, there's so many absurd things. Like, like the situation in Palestine. Grieves me every day. I've been to Palestine a number of times. Terrible atrocity of the occupation. But there's something absurd about the occupation. It's utterly absurd. You know, United States media is entirely absurd. The New York Times is one of the most abysmal newspapers. The, the foreign section of the New York Times, the, the section World Affairs or whatever it's called, it's, it's absurd. It's an abomination. You know, Palestinians kill themselves. You know, they, they always die in passive voice. Uh, Palestinians die in passive voice. US allies die in active voice. Bashar al-Assad kills. Palestinians died. You see that? It's utterly irrational. But the irrationality of the New York Times is perfectly seen as normal. You know, Shirin Abu Akleh, a Palestinian-American journalist, was assassinated in Jenin. And the New York Times said, Shirin Abu Akleh was shot. Well, yes, she was shot. That's not an inaccurate statement. It's not inaccurate. It's accurate. But it's not rational. Did she get shot by what? And to go back to Noam's speeches in the 1990s, how would a Martian see that? If somebody arrived from Mars and read the New York Times, what would they make of this ridiculous newspaper, your hometown newspaper, which is an office, you know, just a short walk from the People's Forum, which is one of the best institutions in New York City, and thanks to the People's Forum for existing. So the second great methodological you know, uh, dimension of Noam's work is rationality. And linked to that is clarity. There's a clarity about how the world functions. And as you see, the clarity starts from a very simple point, which is, what's the best thing for people, for human beings? What's the best thing for the advancement of human beings? Let's start with that as the premise. The premise of our thinking should be what's best for human beings, not what's best for the United States of America. 
This is the opposite of a nationalist vision. It starts with, how are we going to survive on earth? If we're going to survive on earth, shall we consider, as Noam said, a rational, a, a clear entente between the United States, Russia, China, major powers. Just today, foreign policy had an article which revealed that in April, the Russians and the Ukrainians cut a deal, an interim deal. Foreign policy, not my nutty reporting, which you're welcome to dismiss. But I must say, I seem to not be as much of a hallucinator of a reporter as people I read in the American press. But that's a second. Maybe I just have a high opinion of my own reporting. But let that, let that be. You don't have to agree with me. But for God's sake, the foreign policy magazine, you know, which I often read, not because I learn a lot from there, but I get these little revelations. Today, foreign policy revealed that in April, the Ukrainians and Russians cut an interim deal. The war could have been over in April. By the way, in case you've forgotten, we're at the end of August. That's many months of continued pummeling of Ukraine. Well, very soon after that interim deal was cut and foreign policy doesn't draw the conclusions. See, the reason I read, and I know I learned this from Noam Chomsky, always read the mainstream press. Not because they'll connect the dots, but they slip up. And they give you details that they perhaps don't intend to give you. You've got to read Noam like that. He reads the mainstream press in order to see what they're saying, which they don't know they're saying. Foreign policy said in April, an interim deal was cut. Full stop. Finished. They don't say anymore. But if you go back and timeline this damn thing, you'll discover a few days after the interim deal was cut, who arrives in Kiev? None other. Then that great humanitarian, the giant of Western political developments, the apogee, the top, the mountain top of intellectual and political acumen, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. <laughs> Boris Johnson flies into Kiev, comes and hugs Vladimir Zelensky and whispers in his ear, break that agreement. We. We don't want that agreement. We who talk until we're red in the face about democracy and human rights, we in the Atlantic world, Washington and London, are telling you in Kiev to do something that we want you to do, not what your population wants you to do. There's no democracy there. Why didn't Zelensky come out in front of the media? The guy is a really good speaker. Although 55 African states were invited to his lecture and only 53 said no, two arrived. So he's not that popular in many parts of the world. But Mr. Zelensky could have easily gone to his own public and said, hey, listen, we have a deal on the table, an interim deal with the Russians. Whatever we think of the Russians, let the fighting stop in April. But no, what is democracy nowadays? Not going to your people with the truth and trying to see what your people believe. Democracy really means doing exactly what and this is a phrase from Noam, doing exactly what the Godfather tells you to do. Godfather says, break the deal, you break the deal. Just early, a few hours ago, we were on Millenniums Are Killing Capitalism. We were doing a podcast with these uh, young people. And um, I was, he, he, one of, Jared asked Noam about the Godfather thing. And Noam explained what he means by the Godfather. It's a fascinating part of this book, by the way, this whole Godfather thing. But, you know, I'm not always the best read person on European or the United States. So I know the Godfather from the film, you know, and the Sopranos, which I know in the later seasons becomes hard to watch. But that's how I learned about the mafia and a little bit my own personal life. And I know that even the mafia has a sit down. Even the mafia calls the other gangsters. And I know that they have like a gun under the table, you know pointing at the other people. I know that. But they're eating their spaghetti and meatballs and drinking, <laughs> drinking their really bad Chianti, you know. And they're talking in a kind of stereotypical pigeon Italian, you know, maybe Italian-American. But they have a sit down. They acknowledge it's important to have diplomacy before the shooting starts. The United States is not interested 
even in meatballs and noodles with, you know, the Russians. Or, as we show in the book, completely uninterested in negotiations with the Taliban in 2001, even though the Taliban said, sit down with us, break open the Chianti, you drink it, because we don't drink, but <laughs> we'll sit with you at the table. No negotiation with the Taliban. In the 90s and then again in the 2000s, no negotiation with Saddam, who by the way would have drunk all the wine there. So he'd have no problem with that. But no negotiation. Saddam kept saying in 1990, how do we draw this back? No, not allowed. We're going to bomb you. In 2000, and 2000 2001, 2002, he sent emissaries. Let's dial this back. I don't have anything to do with Al-Qaeda. United States said, no, we're going to whack you. You know, Luca Brazzi sleeps with the fishes. Saddam sleeps in the Gulf. And then the most ridiculous was Libya. But Gaddafi, who has been a nutcase for a long time, and I know people have different opinions on Gaddafi, but Gaddafi repeatedly, after the 1990s, repeatedly said to the West, I want to negotiate. He said, Libya will have no more nuclear weapons. We want to deal with the Lockerbie plane thing. He was negotiating in good faith right through the 90s and 2000s. 2011, Gaddafi said, I don't want a war with the people in Benghazi. I'm happy to back down. When the African Union said, we're going to mediate, Gaddafi welcomed them to Tripoli. France said no. You see what happened to France in all this. Today or yesterday? Yesterday, Emmanuel Macron, that great dip Democrat like Boris Johnson, arrived in Algeria. Algeria, of all places, Algeria. Algeria, the government called the pouvoir, the power. The pouvoir allowed a mass demonstration. You know, Gadda this Gaddafi, I was going to say, Emmanuel Macron was like Queen Elizabeth II. He was sort of waving like this at the crowd. And they were abusing him. They were saying, France, get the hell out of here. Same spirit in Mali. This is exactly the detritus of the fact that Nicolas Sarkozy, 2011, said no negotiation with Gaddafi. Gaddafi, who funded Sarkozy's election campaign, Gaddafi sent suitcases of money to get Sarkozy into the LEC palace. Sarkozy turns around and says, whack him. Gaddafi sleeps with the fishes. I mean, who are these people? If you come back, and I'm going to wrap up with this, if you come back to where Noam started from, he started by saying, look, we have two choices here, right? It's the old Rosa Luxemburg choice. Either we're going to go into, actually, it's not Rosa Luxemburg. 100 years later, it's a much starker choice. She said socialism or barbarism. In fact, it's not barbarism, friends, it's annihilation. And I don't think this is, a, you know, I don't think when Noam uses the term extinction or annihilation, I don't think he's being alarmist. He just said 60% of Pakistan is underwater right now. 60% of Pakistan. Unseasonable rains. This is not the time when it's supposed to rain in Pakistan. 60% of the country underwater. Thousands of people dead. I don't know how much, I haven't seen uh, the New York newspapers or anything. I just got in from Brazil today. I'm a little disoriented. But I don't know how it's being reported. Maybe just as, you know, the climate change. But this is not just climate change. You know how fashionable people have this, the word anthropomorcine. Like humans have done something bad, you know. Once again, humans have done, no, it's not humans. You think you're going to blame the Pakistanis? Pakistani people have brought the floods on themselves. You know, Shirin Shiri Abu Akleh killed herself. No, this is the capitalist class. They are, they are people of no feeling. They are for profit. They would like to see the world destroyed. They are building their own rockets to take them to Mars. And boy, they couldn't go from this planet soon enough for me. You know, I want Elon and his pals to get on his SpaceX and zip off to another galaxy. You know, they have destroyed the planet. And so the words annihilation and extinction, I don't think this is alarmist, frankly, friends. I'm generally not an alarmist person. Um, I can't concentrate long enough to be alarmist. Uh, I, 
So, but I really do think this is where we are. You read the IPCC reports, it's scary. You read the US Department of Energy reports where they write openly about seeking nuclear primacy. That's scary. There are actually people, human beings, flesh, blood, they eat McDonald's, whatever, actual humans in Washington, D.C., who write sentences saying the United States should prevail in a nuclear conflict. And there are actually people who give contracts to actual private corporations to develop so-called intermediate missile systems which could carry nuclear weapons, which could actually be fired at Beijing, at Moscow, wherever. I mean, we share a planet with people who are effectively either suicidal or they think that other people are going to suffer, not them. That they are going to be somehow immune from this annihilation, extinctionist path. That's a choice between annihilation and extinction on one side, which these people think is perfectly appropriate. People with the kind of imagination of Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, even Joe Biden, you know, it's astonishingly inhumane people, actually. Astonishingly inhumane on the one side. And on the other side, there are people like you. And of course, people like Noam Chomsky. You don't want that path. You want something else. You want to salvage something out of the mess that this system has made of the world. You want to salvage something, make something better. That's effectively the choice we have. The problem is that we who want to salvage something spend more time tearing each other's throats apart than we do trying to build a big, powerful people's movement to make the world a better place. I occasionally find the fractiousness of the Western left in particular is so extraordinarily juvenile. Here we are at the precipice of annihilation and extinction, and you are having debates from 100 years ago. When are you going to have a discussion about now? When are you going to focus on now? We put this book together basically for another generation that doesn't know anything about Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, that knows little about how perhaps to understand this terrible conflict the United States is having with China. We put this book together so a new generation can go back and study the record. Study the record with the kind of clarity that we've learned from Noam, with the kind of confidence that I get from him almost every day, with a kind of honesty about the context that produced today, our history that brought us here. The book is very slim. It's a very quick read. Because we don't expect this to be studied in high scholarly places. Because anyway, they are prone to reject anything uh, of this kind. This book is for the masses of young people who we hope will pick this up, whether it's in English from the New Press, Spanish from Capitan Swing, a whole bunch of other languages in which it's going to appear. We want this book to be a book that people read so that they can then build the mass movement to salvage the world. Thanks a lot. So we'll do a, a round. We'll do. We have time now for some questions. So we'll do a round of let's say three from in person, and then we'll let Vijay and Noam respond. Yeah. Okay, Noam. Three questions at a time. We'll just ac accumulate three of them. Okay. First, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Tom Chomsky. He's just such a hero. Thank you. Um, my question is, you spoke at first about the United States um, making every effort to weaken Russia as severely as possible throughout the duration of this war. What, in your view, is the goal of this weakening? Um, you mentioned that Russia has a lot of uh, valuable resources. Is it the goal of the United States to come maybe put in a puppet government, take over those resources? What is the ultimate purpose of weakening Russia so, so, so much? Thank you. Uh, 
I think it's uh, the United States is looking for a kind of regime change in Russia, which will subordinate it to the United States. Uh, that was the goal with the, when the collapse of the Soviet Union took place in 1991. There was Gorbachev's vision. The U.S. had a different one. Uh, Russia, uh, was, the U.S. imposed with, with the support of Russian oligarchs, what called oligarchs. The U.S. imposed market, radical market reforms, which devastated the Russian economy and society. The economy uh, collapsed by about uh, 50%. A sharp increase in deaths. Uh, Russia was o almost prostrate. That's while uh, Clinton was expanding NATO to Russia's borders. Well, one of the things that Putin did was reverse that. The United States would not want to go back to it. That's weakening Russia uh, severely, uh, incorporating it within the US dominated system to confront China. That's not secret. It's quite open as the intended uh, goal. The effect on Russians, on Europeans, on the rest of the world is incidental and massive. And it won't be that the United States escapes. If we do not manage to cooperate with Russia and China, the United States will become like Pakistan today, not tomorrow, but it will happen. Thanks so much to both of you. Um, I wanted to ask about the potential uh, of leveraging the empathy that we see that so many Americans and Westerners have for Ukrainians. Can that be leveraged in a way that people then say, okay, these people are suffering. We need the United States and the West to force diplomacy and negotiation as opposed to these people are suffering. Um, and Putin is a Hitler who has nuclear arms and so must be defeated because of Hitler and Chamberlain. I mean, that's what I see the, the narrative has become. So how can we actually make people who care about Ukrainians, um, to the extent that they do, uh, see that what is needed is not uh, war but actual diplomacy? Um, no, before you answer that, asking you the question is Katie, who has an excellent podcast, the Katie Helper Show, and was also a host of Useful Idiots, which is such a great name for a podcast, don't you think? The Useful Idiots. How, how about that? that? That should be the name of the band that you and I make, Useful Idiots. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, go ahead. She's asked a very important question about the media, which I think you know how to answer. Uh, this last question. Yeah, she, well, she, yeah, go ahead. The outpouring of support for Ukrainians is very admirable, reveals a positive side of our cultural and social attitudes. But let's take it a step further. Suppose, we, as we should, we care about Ukrainians. If we care about the fate of Ukrainians, do we undertake a gamble that says, let's continue the war, continue the suffering, block efforts to stop it, hope that it'll weaken Russia sufficiently so that they'll slink away quietly in defeat, and that they will not use the weapons that they have, and we all know that they have, to devastate Ukraine. If you care about Ukrainians, do you take that gamble? It's a strange way to care about Ukrainians. In fact, uh, if you care about Ukrainians, you'll say, let's stop blocking negotiations. Let's pursue the opportunities that may exist to see if we can bring 
the suffering and the torture to an end, make sure that there is no chance that Russia will resort to the kinds of weapons that will wipe Ukraine out and that uh, an accommodation can be reached. The general outlines of it are well understood. Crucially, it'll center part is clear statement that Ukraine will not join NATO, that it will be, have a status like Austria during the Cold War, or for that matter, like Mexico today. Mexico can't join a hostile uh, Chinese-run military alliance uh, aimed at the United States. You don't need a treaty to say that. If anything like, even remotely like that began to happen, and Mexico would be blown away. It's not even something discussable. So let's have something similar to that with regard to Ukraine. That's a substantial part of the accommodation. There are other parts too. Let's move towards that instead of blocking it and taking an incredible gamble with the fate of Ukrainians. No, no, that's that's good. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, so I wanted to ask, what role do you think Africa may have in the upcoming future, and then what role do you think Africa must have in in uh, the war with Ukraine and Russia and China? It's the role of Africa. Why don't I answer this, Noam? Um, Today, I don't know if you saw that the Chinese government has announced that they're going to uh, wipe out the debt of 17 African countries. Uh, it's a pretty interesting development. I don't think you're going to read about it in the Washington Post tomorrow. Um, this is, if it is written about, it'll be written about as a cynical ploy by the Chinese government. Um, and China attempting to dominate Africa by debt forgiveness um, and so on. Uh, is a remarkable uh, development in power uh, being demonstrated by the Chinese government. Um, well, look, Africa is an interesting case in point, but it's not just Africa. Let's quickly go over something important in the three continents of Africa, Asia, Latin America. In the 1960s, the United States made it very clear that these con the countries in these continents would not be allowed to um, established their sovereignty. And there were three incidents that took place in rapid order that sent the message out there. The first in 1961 was the coup against Patrice Lumumba, which resulted in his assassination. Now, the Congo is the most central, not just geographically, but it's the most important country on the African continent. It's the richest country in terms of its resources, not just minerals and, and metals, but also population size, natural resources, and so on. Congo could simply not be allowed to stand up, as Mao said of China in 1949. It was not to be permitted. Also, you may not know this, but the Congo has a uranium mine from which the uranium was used to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the United States was not going to permit that uranium to get outside the control of the US and Western uh, countries. So the Congo had to be cut down. and significant because the coup against Lumumba sets in motion a series of um, attempts to cut the sovereignty of the African continent down because next to go is the coup against the very great Pan-African leader Kwame Nkrumah in 1966 in Ghana. Nkrumah was cooed when he was in China, in the People's Republic of China on a trip there. And on the return, he had to go into exile, never to return to Ghana. So that's the two coups in Africa in the 60s. Right after that, uh, the Lumumba assassination and coup in 64, there was a brutal coup conducted in Brazil in 1964, a coup which lasted for 21 years, and which was not just about Brazil, because the coup in Brazil set in place a military junta which then, through Operation Condor, conducted a series of coups in South America. That is to say, in Argentina, Chile in 73, next year, 50th anniversary, 
and of course in Paraguay, in you know everywhere really. I mean, uh, it was Operation Condor was a ruthless exercise in the um, the extension of U.S. power through military force. Uh, written about and validated by Samuel P. Huntington um, in a book called something Political Order in a Changing Society. The third important development was the coup in Indonesia, now almost completely forgotten, 1965, when one million people of the left were killed in the matter of a few weeks in Indonesia. The largest communist party in the world, the Indonesian Communist Party, the PKI, was entirely annihilated by the military dictatorship of General Suharto, backed fully by the Australians and the United States, and other powers that um, spread democracy around the world. So in Africa, Latin America, and in Asia, in the space of just five years, 61 to 66, that is to say Lumumba to Nkrumah, the three major powers that would have expanded the possibilities of humanity had to be cut down by the United States. Today, the United States has over 30 military bases on the African continent. Again, little known, uh, I wrote a couple of stories about how the United States has taken over Terminal 3 in the airport in Accra, Ghana, and has established that as a quote-unquote military base. They deny it's a base. They say it's a logistical support facility. Okay, thanks for that. You know, this is postmodernism. You know, no words have any meanings anymore. Logistical support facility is not a base, even though it's entirely, and by the way, when U.S. officials arrive in Ghana, they don't have to have a visa to enter Ghana. They don't even need to show their passports. They just walk into Ghana. They show their military identity card. So they have essentially extraterrestrial extra rights. They don't even have just extraterritorial rights. These people can go anywhere they want, space, other countries, with a U.S. military card. They don't need a passport. I wrote about this story, absolute silence from the mainstream media. I mean, it's extraordinary. The United States military has the right to just land a plane in Ghana's airport, walk right through the terminal, flashing their ID card, walk into Ghana with their weapons intact. That's amazing. They can go to a film theater in Accra, watch a film with their guns. It's amazing. You know, guns are not really permitted in Ghana, but the US military can carry guns everywhere, just like US school teachers must carry guns everywhere, you know. Zambia, United States cutting a deal with Zambia, new base. Over 30 military bases, including the world's largest drone base in Agadez, Niger. No mention of this in the United States. No, what does the US press focus on? China is colonizing Africa. China is colonizing Africa, not the French. It's not Xi Jinping showing up in Algeria and people saying, China, go away. In fact, they are saying, China, bring your investment. China, come now. You know, we want Chinese investment. No, they are saying, Macron, go. We don't want the French. The French had to leave Mali, in fact. The United States has such an enormous military presence in Africa that when four Marines were killed a few years ago in Niger, the US Senate's Foreign Relations Committee, the chairperson said, I didn't know we had troops in Niger. I don't think this character knew where Niger was. I have a feeling he was confusing Niger with Nigeria. You know, the Nigerians and the Nigerians. I, I don't know if he has a good map of the Sahel. But how is it possible the Senate Foreign Relations Committee of the United States chairperson does not know that the United States has the world's largest drone base in Agadez, Niger, which is just south of Arlit, Niger, which is a town garrisoned by the French military because Arlit produces yellow cake uranium, which lights about two thirds or something like that of the households in France. Now, how is it possible that a high official of the United States government doesn't know that their military has a base in Niger? Either they are lying to the public, that's for you to find out, or they are simply ignorant, which is incredible. That means the deep state is so deep that even your elected officials don't know it exists. So this is a problem for US de democracy. The question you asked is, what role should Africa play in the world today, right? I'm asking you, what role should you play today in the world? Have you even held your own elected officials to account when they built 30 bases on the African continent, military bases, to subordinate African sovereignty? 
What have people in the United States said about that? Let me tell you, crickets, crickets, crickets. There were so many US Congress people who went on Nancy Pelosi and Markey's mission to Taiwan to go and save the Taiwanese people. Uh, the most ridiculous mission conducted by a US official in a very long time, utterly ridiculous, um, because it didn't help US foreign policy aims at all. In fact, it's going to hurt US chip manufacturers. Um, sub, you know, uh, whatever those things are called. Those manufacturers are going to get hurt because now the Chinese are convinced we've got to make our own chips. Well, goodbye to the chip market, not only in the US, but the chip market in Taiwan is going to be hurt because the Chinese are saying we need to build factories on the mainland. Uh, that's the end of Chi Taiwan's slight economic advantage that is, it has, exporting chips. What have you done? That's what I want to know. I mean, the way in which the United States government runs roughshod on the African soil is incredible. From at least 1961 till the present day. Blinken went on a quote-unquote African tour recently. Blinken. The things he said there were so embarrassing. So embarrassing. And this is a man who claims to be sophisticated because he speaks French. You know, he speaks French. He should watch the tape of the Algerians booing Macron. He doesn't need subtitles for that. He might learn one or two lessons from watching that tape. Thank you so much for your presentations and your book. Um, I have been actually watching too much of PBS lately as an exercise of learning about the Democrats' whitewash. And I have, you know, because for being Brazilian and knowing how the media is a public concession, but has the corporate media dominating, five families basically dominating the narrative and making the public support even the, the dictatorship you or the, the coup that you, you mentioned in 1964. I wondered if there is a way, because I always with this mind of an activist thinking, if there is a way, uh, since this, the pub TV is also public concession here, um, is there a way that we can actually, although we are creating all our evolutionary media, that we can get mainstream media with our hands and be able to change the narrative in that way, in a, you know, in a way that we charge them for accountability of our public money? Noam, why don't you tell people how often you've been on PBS? Um, let alone CNN or NBC. Why don't you give us a list of the times that you've been on PBS? That's pretty pretty easy. Zero. <laughs> Actually, it was kind of funny when I I lived in Boston most of my life, and uh, the flagship station of uh, uh, N NPR is WGBH in Boston, and. Uh, People knew me pretty well in Boston. I was rather visible, talks and so on. So there was a lot of pressure on NPR to allow me to appear on WGBH. Uh, great pressure. Finally, they agreed. It was quite interesting. What I'll tell you what happened. They agreed. They, they, I don't know if they still have it, but on their main program, All Things Considered, they used to have a five minute uh, section on at 525 one day where they reviewed books. So there was a lot of pressure on them to let me have an interview about a book on that section. They finally agreed. Uh, I, I, I don't listen to the radio much, frankly, but I was called at five o'clock one e that evening by the publisher saying I should listen because they're going to run this piece that they recorded on 525. So I listened. 525 came along, five minutes of music. Uh, I started getting phone calls from all over the country because they had announced it at five o'clock, asked me what happened. I said, I didn't know. Finally, people called the main office in Washington. They denied it had happened, said it's on the schedule. And finally, they called back and told me apologetically that at five o'clock, when it was announced, one of the top executives heard that I was going to be on and ordered them to cut off the five minutes. 
Well, I almost made it to NPR, but uh, a couple of times. <laughs> Guess what? There's a lot more, a lot, a lot of funny incidents. That's one. I don't know what to say. I really, that, I mean, if Noam Chomsky can't get on liberal US media, <laughs> and you know, in the book, we go over the uh, pulping of a book that Noam wrote on, um, on the nature of the media. And I don't know if this is commonly known, but one of his books was pulped. Um, because the, there was immense pressure on the publishing house not to allow the book to get out there. So for which reason, I highly recommend get this book quickly um, before it disappears. Uh, it's not an attempt to get you to buy it, but um, get it quickly because you never know. You never know. It's democracy, isn't it? An interesting concept. Uh, democracy is an interesting concept because we don't see it much as an aspirational concept. We keep getting told that it actually exists. That, you know, it's actually not an ideal, but it's real. And it, it's real in the institutions of the United States. Um, it's, a, it's a funny business, this idea of democracy. And the kind of institutional arrogance in the US about democracy. I well remember the 2004 Republican convention in New York City. I happened to be here. I was invited by Mike Albert and um, I think then the Breck Forum, they held an event uptown with Naomi Klein, um, Robin Kelly. I was there and there were one or two other people. And you know, they wanted us to talk about what was called life after capitalism. By the way, they uh, had a box in the entrance for that event. And during the event, somebody stole the money. So um, there's that, uh, just, to, just to tell you that little anecdote. But then maybe two or three days later, I, I happened to be with my um, notebook trying to cover the protests, you know, the protests, democratic protests against the Republican National Convention. And I was standing there with my notebook and, you know, had a, the press credentials and so on. The police officer decided that I basically, you know, I've dressed like this my whole life, um, either blue or black jeans, some kind of shoes. And t I like T-shirts. I wear T-shirts. For some reason, the police officers, four or five of them, decided I didn't look like a real journalist. I looked more like an activist. So they just handcuffed me to a bicycle rack and, and left. And I, I sat there for, I think, several. There were others as well. I wasn't alone. The problem for me with that democracy was I really needed to go to the toilet uh, because uh, it was several hours. And this democracy didn't allow me to urinate. And I thought, this is a curious democracy. Um, not only do they handcuff the press to a bicycle rack. Now, the thing is, it's a funny city because there are lots of bicycle racks. Because even then, it's very interested in green this and green that. But there are no public toilets. So you can ride your bike and park your bike where you want, but there's nowhere to go and take a piss. Well, I had a double problem. Not only were there no public toilets, but I was chained to the rack. So what was I to do with this democracy? This democracy that day was super unkind to me. And I couldn't file my story because, again, I was chained to, I couldn't write a story. And the thing I hate doing is writing a story about myself. You know those stories that sometimes journalists like, I was chained to a bicycle rack. Who cares what I'm, you know, whether I was chained or not? But for me, that was the only story. That was the only story democracy allowed me to think about. So that's the limit of US democracy. Um, there are certain people allowed to repeat what the State Department tells you, and they call that journalism. And the other people, I suppose, well, they should be chained to bicycle racks. Want to get another question in? Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I hope that wasn't me. Anyways, um, yeah, well, this question is kind of directed towards both of you, and I really appreciate you for, for everything you said. Um, in response to the Africa question, you said something along the lines of hold your elected officials accountable. What are you doing, et cetera? So I kind of want to ask a very practical question, which I'm sure you've received a lot, that for those of us like the US left living within the imperial core, what do you think are viable strategies to seize political power and ultimately combat like these imperialist warmongering projects we're talking about? Please go ahead. 
go ahead, Noam. You go first, please. I'll follow you. See what you say. <laughs> the only strategy that has ever worked in the past and has worked here and the only one that's ever been suggested is to get to work, educating, organizing, picking up activities that are designed, activism that's designed to bring people to understand more about the world in which they live, uh, join together, uh, form mass protests, uh, force had the powerful to adjust course, maybe overthrow them. It's no, there's no single answer that says, here's a way to do it. There's this kind of hard, dedicated work, which can succeed. So let's take the media, since we're talking about it. There's a lot of critique about the media today, and there is a lot to criticize, but they're a lot better and more open than they were 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, go back and take a look at what was appearing then. A lot of it would be unimaginable today. Didn't happen by magic. It happened by the activism of the 1960s, which civilized the society in many ways, it led to a con an environment in which young journalists, young people who are now journalists, grew up, imbibed those changes. They write differently. They're more open than they were. You compare then and now, it's dramatic. So yes, plenty of problems to today, but it's much better than it was in the past. And it can get better in the future if you get to work. That's the answer. There's never been another answer. It's absolutely correct. And let me give you a, a practical answer. And I, and I know I'm doing this on the record. And I, I suppose I'll be uh, accused of inciting something. But here goes. This is New York City. New York City has a congressman that represents one of the boroughs, I've forgotten where, Congressman Gregory Meeks. Congressman Meeks in the last period has done two things in terms of foreign policy, for which I don't think he's received any pushback. The first is he sponsored a bill in the US Congress that demands that Russia not be present on the African continent. So the United States is essentially entering African states, 55 of them, and telling them who they are supposed to trade with and who they are not supposed to trade with. Part of that bill is going to now move into China, saying that African states, under pressure from the United States, must break ties with China. This is Gregory Meeks, liberal Democrat from New York City. No pushback against him, I don't think. Secondly, Congressman Meeks went to Taiwan with Nancy Pelosi. Um, a ridiculous move, as I said earlier. I don't think he received any pushback. This is largely a left liberal city. I don't know if the left, fractious as it might be, has decided to go and picket Congressman Meeks's office in one of the boroughs where he has his office. I don't think there's been a letter writing campaign, a telephone campaign or anything. That bill that Congressman Meeks has for the African continent is an extraordinarily dangerous bill because it's going to intensify a cold war on Africa and Africa doesn't need that. African countries right now need to establish their own sovereignty and produce a dignified policy for their own people. So when I say something like, what are you doing? I'm not saying it abstractly only. I'm asking you, what are you going to go and tell Congressman Meeks? Are you going to let a liberal Democrat in New York City bring us closer to annihilation? Or are you going to tell him to back off and concentrate on the collapsing bridges and collapsing dreams of the people of the United States? I think it's about time that in cities like New York, your elected officials not be allowed to behave like gangsters around the world and come back home and smile and talk about LGBTQ, racism, ending this, ending that. Don't take them seriously. Don't give them one minute of courtesy. Because for all of that 
nicety that they spout in the United States, they are creating chaos around the world. It's not Marco Rubio alone who's doing this, gangster that he may be. It's Gregory Meeks, a liberal Democrat from your city. Take some steps to at least tell him that you don't agree with this kind of policy making. That's the kind of action that starts to build the movements that Noam is talking about. We recently celebrated the 100th birthday of one of the great Americans of our time, close personal friend of Noam Chomsky, and that's Howard Zinn. From Howard Zinn, we learned this lesson over and over again. Every final chapter of every book ends up being the same chapter. Every chapter that ends a book that Howard Zinn wrote ended with saying, go out there, build, massify our ideas, build the big movements like the civil rights movement that are going to transform society. We can't transform society by ideas alone. These books that Noam and I write or the interviews that Noam gives or that I give, these are interventions into the public sphere. Ideas don't make history. If they did, Noam would have changed the world a long time ago because nobody is as brilliant as him. Ideas don't by themselves make history. Ideas have to have a material force. The material force of ideas for us is not money because money can give ideas an extraordinary extra power. For us, we who don't have money, ideas must captivate, they must electrify mass movements. Mass movements have to take those ideas and change the world. Build those movements. Build those movements. We are at the precipice of annihilation. We have only two choices, annihilation or salvaging a future. That choice can only be answered by you. It can't be answered by Noam in the last chapter of a book, certainly can't be answered my, by me, because I often run out of ideas when the book comes toward the conclusion. And I just want to end my book by saying, it's done. That's all, folks. <laughs> you have to be the last chapter of the books we've written. So please, you have to go and write that final chapter. Thanks. Thank you, BJ. I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm going to have to leave you at this point, and that's a perfect point at which to say goodbye. What you said is the crucial message. Thanks for saying it, and saying it that eloquently and forcefully. And I'd like to thank you all for coming and apologize that I have to leave at this point. Thanks a lot, Noam. Thank you so much, everybody. This was just the start of the conversation. And thank you so much, Vijay and Noam, for, for bringing us through this great, great evening. Um, let's have another round of applause for Vijay. Thanks. So um, I know many of you have copies of the book. There's also other books by Vijay at the front, if you would like to get them. Um, you will be signing, and you can find him. We're going to have a small space for him up uh, near the front. I also want to tell you, if you haven't had enough from VJ and you also want to continue discussing, we know that U.S. democracy is not really democracy. We've been talking about this tonight. But we also know that there are other experiences of actual people's democracy around the world that the U.S. doesn't want us to know about. So uh, I want to tell you all about an event on the 24th. Uh, that the International People's Assembly and the People's Forum and other organizations are organizing. Uh, this is going to be at the Riverside Church, if you know it. Uh, if not, you can look it up. Uh, and we're going to hear from Vijay, but we'll also hear from Bruno Rodriguez and Carlos Faria, who are the foreign ministers of Venezuela and Cuba, where there are actual projects of, of people's democracy happening. We'll also hear from Kristen Richardson Jordan, who is a council member in New York City and Harlem and from Claudia de la Cruz in the People's Forum, and we'll have music, and it will be a really important discussion. So if you want to get your tickets for this event, it is limited, so please get your tickets. Um, you can see me, and you can also go to peoplesummit.info uh, slash register. So you can see me for more info. Uh, 